Well, thank you, Yue, and uh, it's uh, wonderful to see uh, so many friends here. Uh, uh, well, I, of course, I want to thank uh, C.T. Chung, Chita Chung, for inviting me. He's an old friend. Maybe that has something to do why, with why I'm in, why I'm here. Uh, and uh, uh, but it's it's great to see uh, uh, lots of old friends, including my former student Ted Slayman, <laughs> back uh, when I when he was an undergraduate at Penn State, um, and. Uh, and uh, Antonin Kuchera, who first introduced me to algorithmic randomness, and many other people here. Uh, uh, you know, I'm just delighted to see you all. Um, so uh, uh, maybe you're wondering why I'm at Vanderbilt University, but my website is at PSU, which is Pennsylvania State University. That's because I'm affiliated with both universities. I, I retired from Penn State some years ago and m with my wife moved to Vanderbilt University. It's a, it's a uh, well, we, we, we like to call it the Harvard of the South. It's, it's in the southern United States. And uh, it's, but it has the atmosphere of an Ivy League school, I must say, it's a private university. And uh, it, has, it has that, it has that feeling, and it's a very good university. Uh, and my title there is research professor, which uh, is, I don't get a salary, but uh, I'm, I'm treated as a professor. I can work with students and so on, and apply for research grants, things like that. So that's, wh that's where I am. Uh, this, uh, this is, this, in the talk, I'll be discussing uh, some current work uh, in higher recursion theory with uh, my, my uh, uh, with Hayden Jananthan, he is, uh, well, let me go to the next slide here. Um, he is uh, a, my, a PhD student at Vanderbilt University. And uh, he's just getting started. I mean, he's, he's very good and very energetic, but, but uh, I don't know if, I don't know whether his PhD thesis will be about uh, recursion theory uh, directly or not, but I mean, you know, he's interested in many things. But uh, but this is uh, uh, this is some work that we've been doing just recently. And let me say about this: um, this is work in progress, very much. I was encouraged by the fact that this this uh, uh, meeting here is called a workshop, not a conference. So I take workshop to mean that we're supposed to collaborate. You know, go over in the coffee room and talk. Mathematics and uh, uh, so uh, uh, it's um, uh, you know I, I, I I'm I'm just reporting very much on work in progress uh, and I hope uh, all of you will help me to solve the open problems that I mentioned. There are many open problems here. Uh, at least I don't know the answers to, and uh, some uh, some some progress has already been made uh, at this meeting or as a result of this, this meeting here, this workshop, and I'll tell you about that during the talk. Um, the talk, uh, the slides were pre uh, prepared before the talk, uh, before I came here. So uh, I'm gonna spend a, a good deal of time talking about uh, theorems related to the Gandhi basis theorem. Uh, I, Antonio has not in his, uh, He's giving a, a tutorial uh, on, on hyperarithmetic theory and uh, uh, structure, structure theory. Um, he, he, he mentioned uh, some aspects of this already, but uh, I'll, I, 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 well, I, I don't know how it, many, it, it's, it's very, it's very, that's another reason that I decided to talk on this topic at this meeting because, uh, because there's obviously a lot of interest here in hyperarithmetic theory with Antonio's tutorial going on. Um, okay, so and hyperarithmetic hyper theory, let me say, is is chapter one or part one of higher recursion theory. There's there's more to it, uh, uh, and uh, uh, one of the there's there's there is the book of my and and Ted's uh, thesis advisor and uh, Gerald Sachs, 
called higher recursion theory. And part A of the book is hyperarithmetic theory, and then the later parts have to do with other kinds of hyper, uh, other kinds of higher recursion theory, alpha recursion theory, and E recursion theory, and so on and so on. There's a lot of, um, you know, interaction with uh, between recursion theory and set theory there. But this is just a very basic part of higher recursion theory, uh, historically the first part. So, uh, okay. Absolutely. <laughs> I've uh, I've done that. I, I think some 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 uh, some somebody in a different life. I think I did that. <laughs> okay. Okay. Right. Um, so um, so let's see. I want first want to state the Gandhi basis theorem. Uh, a sigma one one class is a is, is so zero one to the n is is the uh, is the Cantor space, and a sigma sigma one one class is a set a subset of the Cantor space which is sigma one one, which means that it's with, it's of this form uh, an arithmetical uh, predicate preceded by an existential quantifier over points in the Cantor space which I may call reals, uh, you know, everybody calls them reals in this field, uh, just points in the Cantor space. So I hope this is clear. It's not important here that S should be a subset of the Cantor space. It could equally well be a subset of the Baer space. But later I'm also going to talk about pi zero one classes where it is important. That's, that's an important distinction. Uh, you know, the, the point being that the Cantor space is compact, while the bare space is, is very far from being compact. Okay, so the Kleene basis theorem, I, I've seen this, I mean, Gerald Sachs used to call this the Kleene basis theorem. Uh, I think it's called that, but I wasn't quite able to track down the reference. But it's, uh, here's what it says, let S be a non-empty sigma in one class, then it has an element which is uh, Turing reducible to Kleene's O. Uh, Antonio has already explained Kleene's O. It's, uh, well, as I'll explain, it's the, it's the analog of the uh, halting problem in recursion theory. Basically, there's recursion theory where you're dealing with the beginning of that subject is the unsolvability of the halting problem. And then you move to hyperarithmetic theory, and the beginning of that subject is the fact that Kleene's O is not hyperarithmetical, but it is uh, pi one one, and so uh, uh, and it's and there's a strong analogy which I want to emphasize between recursion theory and hyperarithmetical theory. Um, so let's see, uh, just explaining all the terminology. Less than or equal sub t denotes Turing reducibility. That is, x and y being points in the Cantor space. X is Turing reducible to y if and only if x is delta zero one in y. Uh, or another way to say this is that x as a function, as an infinite sequence of zero ones, that sequence is computable using the infinite sequence of zeros and ones y as a Turing oracle. In other words, you're allowed to call on uh, finite pieces of information about y as you go along. So that's Turing reducibility. Um, uh, and so, so we're, we're going to deal more with Turing reducibility, but I'm also dealing with hyperarithmetical reducibility in this talk. But uh, an O script O is Kleene's, what Kleene called just capital O, uh, O, and the, the key property of it is that it's a complete pi one one subset of the natural numbers. Antonio explained all this in his tutorial, and maybe, maybe I, 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 I want to assume that that makes sense to everybody. Um, uh, well, uh, the, and this is, this is just like the halt, it's, it's the analog of the halting problem. I mean, O is a complete pi one one set of natural numbers, just like the halting set is a complete recursively enumerable subset of the integers. And in fact, pi one one sets are analogous to recursively enumerable sets or sigma zero one sets. And uh, so that's the analogy. All right, so anyway, this is the Kleene basis theorem, and there's an analogous theorem uh, for pi zero one classes. 
uh, uh, of course. Um, there's an, which is also called, I believe, the Kleene basis theorem. Um, and the, in fact, the two theorems are stated together in one theorem. They're just you know, they're variants of each other. Uh, okay, uh, so this is very old stuff. Uh, the Gandhi basis theorem uh, is a refinement. Well, it's not exactly a refinement. Here's the way Gandhi stated it. I, I actually looked up Gandhi's paper. He, here's, his, here's how he states it. Let S be a non-empty sigma in one class. Then we can find a member of S, a, a point in, the, in S, which is uh, of strictly lower hyperdegree than O. So I, I'm not going to say very much about hyperarithmetical reducibility, but here are the definitions. Uh, less than or equal subhype denotes hyperarithmetical reducibility. X is said to be hype in Y if X is delta 1, 1 in Y. Uh, delta 1, 1 in Y, well, X is hyperarithmetical if and only if it's delta 1, 1. X is hyperarithmetical in Y if and only if it's delta 1, 1 relative to Y. Uh, that, so that's the analog of Turing reducibility here. Um, and uh, of course, then, uh, less than subhype means less than or equal, but not uh, greater than or equal. And uh, hyperarithmetical equivalence is uh, just means that x and y are each hyperarithmetical in the other. A hyperdegree is an equivalence class under that equivalence relation, just like a Turing degree is an equivalence class under Turing reducibility. Okay. So, uh, so he's got, so here's this theorem. Now, these theorems are different, actually, but you can combine them uh, in this theorem of Gandhi here. Uh, uh, you can say, you can say uh, uh, more. So let me, well, so first I have to talk about the hyperjump. Given, and this is, and this, the hyperjump is going to be mentioned frequently in this talk. More, more frequently than hyperarithmetical reducibility. I'm going to mix the two. In other words, I'm going to be talking about hyper jump, but Turing degrees. Turing degrees of hyper jumps. That's the title of the talk. Um, okay, so the hyper jump of X is O relative to X. Kleene's O relative to X. In other words, it's a complete pi 1, 1 relative to X subset of the natural numbers. So this is analogous to the Turing jump of x, defined as h super x equals the halting problem relative to x, which is a complete, the key, key property of that for us is that it's a complete sigma zero one relative to x subset of n. So this is, it's analogous. Uh, it may look a little strange that sigma zero one is analogous to pi one one, but believe me, this is the right analogy. Uh, if uh, you 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 have to uh, you you this this is this is a far-reaching analogy. Uh, roughly speaking, stages of computation in recursion theory just correspond to stages of computation, but stages of computation in hyperarithmetic theory correspond to uh, recursive ordinal recursive ordinals. That's the idea. Um, all right. Now, another theorem of Spector, a, a theorem of Spector actually earlier than Gandhi's, is that if X is, hype in, is of strictly lower hyperdegree than O, then the hyperjump of X is hyperarithmetically equivalent to O. So that's a theorem of, that is, uh, a, that's a theorem of Spector quite early, uh, before Gandhi. And so Gandhi doesn't cite that, but uh, in his paper, but Spector's theorem tells you something very strange if you're, if you're a recursion theorist. It tells you that in the world of the, in, see, in the world of Turing degrees, there are degrees that are less than the halting problem, less than zero prime, but their jump is not the halting problem. It's, it could be bigger than the halting problem, right? I mean, uh, so here's uh, zero and zero prime, the halting, the Turing degree of H. Uh, there are degrees in here, uh, A, such that the jump, A prime, is you know, out here somewhere, bigger than zero prime. Uh, 
there, there are de things like that. But in the world of hyperdegrees, if you have any degree here, and uh, uh, let's just call it the, 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 the hyperdegree of, of O, uh, the jump has to be, uh, well, let's say, let's say this is the hyperdegree of X, then uh, this has to equal a prime, in other words, the hyperdegree of OX. So there are no, uh, every degree is low. This is, in, in the world of hyperarithmetic theory, every degree is low. Uh, every degree less than uh, O, Kleene's O, is, is low. So, uh, is, so that, you know, in other words, the situation is much more complicated in the world of Turing degrees. There are low degrees, high degrees, you know, low two, high two, et cetera, all kinds of things. So it's, it's a much more complicated situation. So hyperarithmetic theory, I've always thought that it's sort of simpler than recursion theory in some ways. Um, all right, uh, yeah, here I'm trying to say that in this paragraph. By the way, these slides are available on my web page and so on. Um, I'm gonna revise them after, after I go home, but there is a, what I'm showing you is, is there on my web page now. Um, okay, now Gandhi's, so that's a theorem of Spectre, so that has implications because Gandhi basis theorem says there's a member of S which is of strictly lower hyperdegree than O, then it follows that X is hyperarithmetically low. Um, but another, uh, the, 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 another piece of information implicit in Gandhi's proof of the Gandhi basis theorem is that X is Turing reducible to O. So Turing reducibility comes into this also. And because, in other words, he proves it by using the Kleene basis theorem and gets it recursive in O that way. Um, so, uh, so combining that, you get this uh, statement here, which I'm, is property with tribute to Gandhi. Let S be a non-empty sigma one, one class, then for some X in S, uh, X is Turing reducible to O and hyperarithmetically low. It's the hyperjump of X is hyperarithmetically equivalent to O. Uh, I should say uh, this is these these Kleene basis theorem and Gandhi basis theorem. They're examples of basis theorems. A basis theorem is a theorem that tells you if a certain kind of nicely d describable set is non-empty, then it has a, an element which is also nicely describable in some way. Uh, then there's these these basis theorems are very important foundationally because a lot of foundational programs in mathematics had to do with uh, you know questioning whether we need to really have all these com very complicated sets can we get away with just simpler sets you know uh, uh, and and so so it's nice to know that if if there is a set with a certain property, then there's a simple set with that property. There's, you know, a, a, nice, a nice uncomplicated set. Uh, all right, so that's the Gandhi basis theorem, really com a combination of Spectre's and Gandhi's result. Um, and it's appropriate to attribute this to Gandhi and all of the relevant textbooks attributed to Gandhi. But now look at this other theorem. Let S be a non-empty sigma one, one class, then for some x in S, the hyperjump of x is Turing equivalent to O. So this is, this is hyperarithmetically low in a stronger sense. Not only is it hyperarithmetically equivalent to O, but it's Turing equivalent to O. Okay, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's a, a refinement. That's a, that's a, I say there that it's an apparently stronger theorem, as I will remark in a, on the next slide or uh, one, maybe one or two slides from now, it's actually, it actually is a stronger theorem. Uh, I'll explain. Uh, so, but, you know, on the face of it, I mean this property that the Turing, the, the hyperjump of X is Turing equivalent to O implies both of these properties, that it's X itself is Turing reducible to O and OX is hyperarithmetically equivalent to O. That's implied, right? Uh, so, th so this is a, but, but you don't, you know, there's a question of 
is this equivalent to this? Uh, the answer is no, it turns out, uh, as you would expect. All right, so, so there's this theorem. I'm just calling it a folklore th theorem. What happened to me was uh, last fall I was doing some work with uh, Gerhard Jaeger and Michael Ratjen. They're, they're uh, German proof theorists, and they, uh, they I, I came up with this folklore theorem uh, because it was relevant to what we were doing. And I proved it. I, I thought, oh, I know how to, I, can, I think I can prove that, and I proved it. And, and, and then, but then I asked around later, and I found out that this is known to many people. And so, to my surprise, I found out that many people just call this the Gandhi basis theorem. Uh, they, but it's, it's not there in Gandhi's paper. Um, and and so, so I was trying to figure out uh, what, what, what is the history of this theorem? What, that's why the question marks indicate I don't know where this came from, who, who first proved this. Um, uh, how, it's, it's a folk, it seems to be folklore. A lot of people know it. Uh, I'm, I'm, see, in fact, it sometimes seems to me I'm the only one who didn't know this. But, but, uh, but there it is. Um, it, it appears, as I said, in, in, the, in the book by Chita Chong and Liang Yu, recursion theory, their recursion theory, their, it's really a book on hyper recursion theory, uh, high, higher recursion theory, uh, they actually state it as an exercise, uh, but with no proof or references. So they, they're not saying where it came from. And, uh, okay, it's, it's, it's true, and they got it from somewhere, but I, I, I'm not clear where it came from. Um, uh, and, but many people knew it. Uh, okay, so uh, now how do you prove this thing? Well, you prove it by means of forcing. The easiest way to prove it to me is forcing with non-empty sigma 1-1 one, one classes. That's a technique. Uh, that was introduced by Leo Harrington in, in, in a manuscript in 1976. This is one of Leo's unpublished manuscripts that are very basic to uh, mathematical logic. Um, uh, and uh, this technique was introduced by him. It's well known in descriptive set theory. He used it to prove, to give a... Uh, a, well, the title of the paper is a, a powerless proof of a theorem of silver. This is a theorem in descriptive set theory about analytic equivalence relations. So um, uh, it, it's, well, it's known in descriptive set theory now. Uh, I knew about it just because, you know, I, I was in contact with Leo Harrington uh, at the time. Um, and my first proof of this folklore theorem uh, used Harrington's technique. Later, I, I have another proof, which is more in the spirit of Gandhi and Spectre, but it's, not, it's just not there in Gandhi's paper. So, so let's compare these two theorems. Here's Gandhi's theorem, and here's the folklore theorem. And it's natural to ask whether they're really the same theorem in the sense that the two conclusions are equivalent. Uh, is it true, is, is the conjunction of these two properties, X Turing reducible to O and its hyperjump is hyperarithmetically equivalent to O, is that, is that equivalent to just saying the stronger statement that the hyperjump of, o, of X is Turing equivalent to O? Uh, so does... Uh, do these do these two conditions um, Im imply uh, th this other condition? And the, the difference being that here we have hyperarithmetic equivalence and here we have Turing equivalence. Uh, or more generally, uh, if x if we don't assume that x is Turing reducible to O. But we do assume that x is hyperarithmetically low, generalized low, let's say, generalized low in the sense of hyperarithmetic theory. Ox is hyperarithmetically 
equivalent to the join of O and X, is, does that imply that it's Turing equivalent to the join of O and X? Uh, well, and you know, when I wrote these slides, I thought the answer is no, but I didn't, I didn't know a, an example. So I put these slides up, and uh, within a matter of uh, a day, Ted Slayman uh, emails me and says, oh, sure, I have an example. And he came up with an example. So great. Uh, that's, that's, uh, this, is wor this workshop is really uh, solving a lot of problems for me already. Uh, so please help us. Ted said, OK, I'll help him out, you know. <laughs> All right. So, um, uh, so, uh, so he, what Ted pointed out is that uh, if, you, if you do Sachs forcing, you've, that is, you force with perfect closed sets, in the, in the world of hyperarithmetic theory, you get a real X. You know, any sufficiently generic real in that sense of forcing uh, will be will be a counterexample uh, to this. In other words, it'll it'll be hyperarithmetically equivalent to O plus X, but not Turing equivalent to O plus X. Uh, and uh, you know, we we can I, I mean, Ted can explain it to you, or I can explain it to you. And, and, and Ted now tells me that, Ted also told me that uh, it's also a counter, you can also get, using a similar method, you can also get a counterexample to, to the first question. Uh, that's a little harder, but uh, he, he, he thinks, uh, he, he, and I, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I hope I know, I hope I understand that before the end of this conference, or this workshop. Okay, so that's uh, where we are uh, with that. So this is not, so I just want to say this, this folklore theorem is not the Gandhi basis theorem, for those of you who call it that. It's, not, it's just not that. Uh, it's, it's, it's not quite what you, Leo told me, I asked Leo about this, and he said, well, yeah, maybe it's not the Gandhi basis theorem, but we should have a lot of respect for Gandhi. I do, I have a lot of respect for Gandhi. It's just, <laughs> you, know, uh, you know, so okay, just the history. Uh, so the, the, the Gandhi basis theorem may be viewed as a hyper... Now, okay, now I want to make another comment about something related to the Gandhi basis theorem. Um, the Gandhi basis theorem is analogous to a well-known theorem in recursion theory. It's, it's the hyper-arithmetical analog of a well-known recursion theory theorem, basis theorem, is, which is called the low basis theorem. So let P be a non-empty pi-01 class, then we can find x in P such that the Turing jump of x, h, the halting problem relative to x, is Turing equivalent to the halting problem. Um, that is exactly the same statement as the folklore theorem if you replace pi 0, 1 by sigma 1, 1 and you replace h by o, the hyper jump. Instead of Turing jump and the halting problem, you have the hyper jump and clean ESO. It's exactly the, analogous to that. And what you're still using in the folklore theorem, you're still using Turing equivalents. Um, now, yes, yes, it, it did, but but just intellectually, it's an it's an analogous. Uh, well, analog doesn't mean necessarily that it came uh, first. Usually, you, usually people talk that way, but like you know, it's a copy of it. It's not a copy of it because all right. Um, anyway, uh, in that same paper, Jokish and Soar also proved this. Uh, generalization of the low basis theorem. It's not well known, but it's not what, it's, a few people know this and notice this in their paper, but it's right there in their paper and they even sketch a proof of it. Uh, so here's what it says. Let P be a non-empty pi zero one class with no recursive elements. Uh, that's a little extra hypothesis that you have to put on this. Then for all Y, we can find an X such that in P, 
such that the Turing jump of X is equivalent to uh, uh, the halting problem join X, also Turing equivalent to the join of the halting uh, set with Y. So what this, what this means is you can find, given a, a non-empty Pizer 1 class with no recursive elements, you can find members of that class which have, whose jump is any Turing degree that you want, basically, any, any, any reasonable Turing degree, any, any Turing degree above the halting problem. Uh, so that's there in their paper. And now I want to present the analogous, now this is an analog because it came much later, the, the, the generalization of the Gandhi basis theorem and its folklore refinement. So this is something that uh, Jananthan and I proved. Let S be a non-empty sigma one one class with no hyperarithmetical elements, then for all Y we can find an X in S such that the same thing happens with Turing jump replaced by hyper jump, uh, a halting problem replaced by O, and uh, that's it. It's just, it's just exactly analogous to their, th their theorem. Um, but to, with Turing reducibility, not hyperarithmetic reducibility. By the way, Turing reducibility uh, is the master, is, is the, mo the most important kind of reducibility, in my opinion. And, and you know, the hyper jump is it, just the omega 1 CK jump. Uh, that's, that's what it is. Uh, in other words, it's, it, the hyperjump of X is the omega 1 to the X jump of X. Uh, and it's, it's a Turing degree, really. It's well the hyperjump is certainly well defined up to Turing degree. Um, and and uh, I mean, if two things are hyperarithmetically equivalent, then they have the same, uh, their hyperjumps are the same up to Turing degree. So, um, so we proved that uh, the proof is not difficult. It just uses Harrington's technique again. Uh, the special case where S is omitted, if you just say for all Y, there exists an X such that uh, this conclusion holds, and just ignore S, that was proved earlier by another uh, uh, practitioner of higher recursion theory called John McIntyre. I understand Angus McIntyre is going to be at this, uh, here, be around here this summer, right? He's, yeah, but uh, uh, this, is, this is not Angus McIntyre, it's John McIntyre. Um, and and uh, he, he, his proof used co-enforcing, it's published in the JSL. Um, and our proof, of course, uses Harrington's technique of forcing with sigma one one classes. So, so uh, uh, of the of the hyperarithmetic uh, analog. So, uh, so there's uh, there's that. That's one thing we did. All right. Uh, so, uh, all right. So, so much for the Gandhi basis theorem and related theorems. I, I've already taken up uh, half of my time, I think. All right, now let's go on. So, so this made us think, you know, what, the, what other basic theorems, see, in other words, let me, uh, just this, the, the Turing degree version of this is, uh, of this uh, jump inversion is, is just uh, Friedberg's jump inversion theorem. But there, the, jump, the jump operator, the Turing jump operator, has other well-known basic properties, the Posner-Robinson theorem, and there's something called the pseudo-jump inversion theorem. Uh, these are very, very basic properties of the Turing jump, and uh, or I think of them that way. And what, uh, what, what can we generalize those to hyperarithmetic theory in a similar way? So, so let's, let's look at that, and here we're mostly floundering, but uh, we have some results. Uh, so another extension of the Friedberg jump theorem, I should have stated it by now, the Friedberg jump theorem, but anyway, you know what it is. It's, well, I'll, I'll, I think it's stated on a later slide. Um, this is a theorem in 1981, basic property of the Turing jump operator. 
for let, let's let's try to read this in an easy way. Start with, let let z be a non-recursive real, any non-recursive real. Then you can find an x such that uh, z join x that x joins z up to the Turing jump of x. And you can make the jump the Turing jump of x be any Turing degree you want. Okay, that's that, that's the Posner Robinson theorem. Um, okay, uh, now, and I state it this way just to make sure it's all stated correctly, but this is what it says. Now, uh, we tried to prove the uh, hyperarithmetical analog. Well, first we tried to find out whether it's true. Um, it's sort of attributed to Wooden in different places, but Wooden, he proved a paper proving a, he, he, he published a paper proving a related result, but not exactly this. And uh, uh, about TT equivalence, uh, that I, sorry, I left that one out of the references here, but, but that's, you know, and I guess he must be using the same method as in that paper to, to prove this. But anyway, this is the hyperarithmetic analog of the Posner-Robinson theorem. For all, it, it just replace non-recursive by non-hyperarithmetical, and then uh, replace the Turing jump or Kleene, uh, the halting problem by Kleene's O. And that's it, it's, the, it's completely analogous. Um, so uh, now this theorem, we didn't succeed in proving. We tried to use sigma and one forcing, you know, Harrington forcing, but it doesn't work. And, um, uh, but, w but we found these references and I asked Liang Yu and C.T. Chong about it and uh, other people. Uh, and it, it, they, they, they told me basically that Slayman and Wooden knew how to prove this. So I wrote to Slayman and Slayman Ted, Ted uh, sent us his uh, proof, a sketch of his proof. Uh, and we have written it up, and we plan to publish it. Uh, the, the proof uses the same idea that he's used previously in generalizations of the Posner-Robinson theorem, namely kumabe slayman forcing. Oh, Kumabe is also here in the, in the audience. It's, this is a higher recursion theory uh, reunion here. Um, 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 so, uh, so, and the interest, an interesting aspect of this proof, as opposed to previous ones, is that it uses forcing, due to Slayman's proof this is, it's, it uses forcing, you know, usually when you, when you use forcing, you're forcing over a well-founded model of ZFC. You know, accountable, usually accountable, well-founded model. Here we're for, forcing over a, a countable model of ZFC, which is not well-founded. It's an omega model, but it's not well-founded. You have to do that to prove this theorem. So you need to check that all, that forcing works over non-well-founded models. <laughs> it just works, but, you know, it's just not presented that way in textbooks. So, so, uh, so poor Jananthan had to, you know, go through all this. Uh, so, so, so that's, uh, but it's, it's okay. Uh, all right. So that's, uh, that's the uh, analog of that. Uh, now let's, uh, let's talk about pseudo jump inversion. So a pseudo jump, so what do I mean by a pseudo jump? A pseudo jump is also called an REA operator, if, if anybody knows that term. It's, it's, uh, it's an operator which carries x to something that is recursively enumerable in x and above x in the sense that it includes x. Um, all right, it's, uh, so, so ux is uniformly sigma zero one in x, and you have to throw x in. I mean, ux might, you know, if it's just sigma zero one in x, it may not 
actually include X as, as part of itself, but we join it with X to make sure it does. So that's called a pseudo jump operator. And of course, the standard example of a pseudo jump operator is the Turing jump operator, right? All right, now, uh, pseudo jump inversion theorem due to Jokic and Shore, not, not Jokic and Soar, is, um, is this that for all Y and all pseudo jump operators U, we can find uh, an X like this that the pseudo jump of X is equivalent to X and it's and it's anything you want to want it to be above the the Turing degree above the halting Turing degree of the halting problem so uh, and it's proved exactly like the Friedberg jump theorem you just imitate the proof of the Friedberg jump theorem and it gives you this but this is a powerful theorem this is an interesting theorem and um, uh, it has applications that the Friedberg jump theorem just doesn't have. So, and, and then there are variants and improvements of this and so on. Uh, but the proof of this is very easy. It's just the proof, basically the proof of the Friedberg jump theorem in just using a pseudo jump operator instead of the standard jump operator. So, um, so as I say, it follows the proof, the original proof of the Friedberg jump theorem due to Friedberg 1957. Now, so we, we want to know, okay, can you lift this? Can you, can you, is there an analogous theorem in hyperarithmetic theory? So we define a pseudo hyperjump operator to be the obvious thing. It's an operator which carries x to something that's pi 1, 1 relative to x, and then join it with x to make sure it includes x. Pi 1 1 being the analog of recursively enumerable. Okay, so it seems natural, it seemed natural to us, and it does, it still seems natural to hope for a pseudo hyperjump inversion theorem, uh, which would be just like this, except the conclusion would be Vx plus, plus x, and would be, in other words, with this pseudo hyperjump operation instead of a, a pseudo jump operation and Kleene's O instead of the halting problem. It would be analogous, but we have not been able to prove that. That's, that's where we are. Okay. Uh, now, another question is that we thought about was, can you, in, in, in these, uh, uh, in this, in the pseudo, in the Posner-Robinson, uh, the hyperarithmetic version of the Posner-Robinson theorem, can you choose X to be a member of a sigma one one class that you specify in advance? Um, well, and similarly for pseudo jump inversion, except we don't know how to prove the hyperarithmetic analog of. We don't. We don't know that that's true. We don't even know that that's hyperarithmetic analog of pseudo jump inversion is true but if it is can you ever can you prove can you get can you improve it can you refine it further by getting by getting it a, to be a basis theorem you know where you choose it from an, an arbitrary sigma one one class and uh, we have some partial results in the Turing case this has to do with uh, pi zero one classes uh, so, you know subclasses of the Cantor space if P is a nice pi zero one class, which is Medvedev complete, an example of a Medvedev complete class is the class of completions of piano arithmetic. And actually, all Medvedev complete pi zero one classes are recursively homeomorphic to that. So that's the only one, essentially, up to recursive homeomorphism. Um, then uh, you, can, you can choose your x in the Posner-Robinson theorem to belong to that class. And also in the pseudo-jump inversion theorem, you can choose x from, from that class. So that's, that's uh, we do have those kind of refinements if p is Medvedev complete. However, if, if p is not Medvedev complete, we have a counterexample 
uh, there is a pi zero one class such that it, it's non-empty. It no element is recursive, no no non no recursive elements, but every finite sequence of elements of P is uh, generalized low. Okay, that the, the, the Turing jump of the sequence is equivalent to the, the join of the halting problem plus the sequence. Uh, and that's easy to, that's not a difficult construction of a pi zero one class. And such a, such a P cannot have, cannot, you, you can't choose X in P in this, Posner Robinson or in the pseudo jump inversion. Uh, because, you know, you take one element of P, well, the, the other, any, any other element of P is, is not going to be able to join to the halting problem, for example. And it's not going to, its pseudo jump won't be the halting, you know, it's just not going to work. So, uh, uh, so that's a counterexample. But we don't know anything else. We we don't uh, you know. And so, an open problem would be to uh, characterize the pi zero one classes which have properties one or two. That is, uh, that you can choose the x for the Posner Robinson or for pseudo jump inversion from P. Uh, and another open problem, even more open, is because we don't have any examples, is to characterize the sigma one one classes which have the hyperarithmetical analogs of property one and two. We don't even know that there are any, we don't know that property one, property two holds in hyperarithmetic theory. Forget about being, belonging to a sigma one one class. Another, these, these are just, you know, seem, just seem like very natural questions that we've thought about, but we don't, uh, we haven't made much progress on. So that's, um, uh, that's, uh, let me say that another, another subject that I'm very interested in is pi zero one classes and, and their Muchnik degrees. They're, you know, uh, viewing them as mass problems. Uh, I'm trying to write a book on this subject, but, um, you know, it's going kind of slowly, but uh, I'll finish it. Um, and uh, so I, I was really, I'm really trying to get Jananthan to do that, but uh, that subject, but uh, we, we got sidetracked into this business in hyperarithmetic theory. So that's about it. Uh, thank you for your attention. Here's uh, the reference here. The slides has, the slide has references to all the literature that I've cited here, uh, including uh, the the book by uh, Chi Ta Chang and Liang Yu, uh, uh, which uh, uh, you, know, you know is very uh, appropriate here. Of course, they're both in the audience here, and Chi Ta is the director of this whole thing, this institute, and uh, uh, so I was glad to be able to uh, cite their book. And they they uh, that that is an excellent modern reference for higher recursion theory. Um, and um, let's see, what else can I say about this? Um, yeah, okay, well that's, that's about it. Thank you. Well, uh, yeah, uh, well, one of the obvious uh, applications, it's not really an application because it, it's already known, but for instance, there is a high degree less than zero prime. That, you, that just follows because you, 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 as your pseudo jump operator, you take, you take, take the construction of a low RE set a low RE but non-recursive set. Relativize that to X. That's a pseudo hyperjump operation. Apply the pseudo hyperjump inversion theorem with that operator to get 
a degree, could get an x whose pseudo jump, that is a low RE set above it, is, is Turing equivalent to zero prime. Well, then, then the jump of that will be high. So you get for free a, a high degree uh, less than zero prime. Now, um, that's, that's, the, and that's the application we had in mind. And uh, you see this, this open question, this, the, the strategy we had in mind for proving this was to generalize the pseudo hyper, you know, to, to prove the hyper, prove the pseudo hyper jump inversion theorem, which would give you, it wouldn't give you a high uh, uh, degree, it wouldn't give you the, any kind of analog of a high degree in hyper arithmetic theory, but it would give you some, it would give you a counterexample to this thing. But we'd, it, it, we just didn't, weren't able to do that, and we never thought of using Sachs forcing. I should have thought of it myself. I mean, you know, I know, I know all about that stuff, but uh, Ted, uh, Ted uh, helped me, steer, steered me the right way there. I mean, he, well, he gave me the answer to that question uh, and, and gave us the answer to that question. So, yeah, so that's the kind of thing. It's, it's a powerful theorem. They use, uh, you know, Jockish and, and Sure, use it to prove all kinds of things. Uh, uh, you know, for instance, one problem, well, I had an old paper where I showed that, um, let's put it this way, uh, zero sharp is the base of a cone of minimal covers in the hyperdegrees. All right, zero sharp, okay. And on the other hand, if V is a forcing extension of L, then there is no cone of minimal covers in the hyperdegrees. Now, the Turing analog of that had been thought about, and people wondered, where is the base of the cone of minimal covers in the Turing degrees? Uh, and there's a paper where it was shown that Kleene's O is a basis, is a base of a cone for that. And uh, Jockish and Shore use pseudo hyperjump inversion or some jazzed up version of it to prove that uh, zero to the omega, the arithmetical jump of zero is the base of a cone. So, uh, so that's, and they, they, that's just one application that they do. There's, there's lots, lots, of, lots of applications for that. So, so yeah, it seems very important and natural to do pseudo hyperjump inversion, but we don't know how to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, uh, well, um, uh, there is no true analog of the PA degree. The, okay, so the class of completions of PA, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's in some sense the strongest uh, pi zero one class. Uh, and equivalent to that is the, uh, the, the you know, class of separating sets for an effectively inseparable pair of RE sets. You can do the analogous thing for pi 1, 1, but uh, there is no true analog of, of PA. Sigma one one closed. Oh, I see. Oh, you mean like a pi zero pi zero one set in the bare space or something like that? Yeah, that that maybe we can maybe that would work. Uh, I mean that would that that's that's possible. We we wanted the full analog with sigma one one. Let's talk about that. Uh, good, I'm glad. 
<laughs> Let's talk about that. That's, that's the kind of thing we should be doing at this workshop is collaborating, right? <laughs>